Hello and welcome to part three, Royal Navy Commandos, uh, Commanders. And well, there is a slightly more complicated kettle of fish. And I say this because people look at them and go, but, but what? What? Who is that? What are they doing? What are they about? And can you explain their rank structure to me? Mm -hmm. So, now normally at this point I talk about my aunt, but please go watch the other videos. Anyway, Royal Navy seniority. So here it is from the bottom to the top. Rear Admiral of Blue, Rear Admiral of the White, Rear Admiral of Red, Vice Admiral of the Blue, Vice Admiral of the White, Vice Admiral of the Red, Admiral of the Blue, Admiral of the White. Eventually, created in 1805, Admiral of the Red, and then Admiral of the Fleet, which would have been created in 1688 and then be traditionally treated as sort of the Admiral of the Red, because the Admiral of the Fleet would be sit with the Red Squadron, because well, that's where the Red Squadron was supposed to be in line. Mm, but, you know, these things happen. And at various points, they have a lot of officers in these roles. Now, what do I mean by lots of animals in these roles? In 1769, there was one admiral of the fleet, Edmund Hawke, Edward Hawke. There were three admirals of the white and four admirals of the blue. So that means pretty much eight total admirals. There were three Vice Admirals of the Red, three Vice Admirals of the White, and four Vice Admirals of the Blue, plus four Rear Admirals of the Red, four Rear Admirals of the White, and five Rear Admirals of the Blue. There are also 22 superannuated Rear Admirals. Um, it's basically a way of getting rid of a captain, is to promote him to Rear Admiral, but then declare him too old for, a, a, for active duty. So that's some of the limits of the uh, flank system, uh, the, of the rank system, and the promotion by rank uh, available. However, flag ranks in 1812. So seven years after the Battle of Trafalgar, Admiral of the Fleet, His Royal Highness the Duke of Clarence, had been appointed to post in 1811. Then admirals. There were 21 admirals of the Red. 20 Admirals of the White, and 20 Admirals of the Blue. There are 65 Vice Admirals, 22 Vice Admirals of the Red, 19 Vice Admirals of the White, 24 Vice Admirals of the Blue, and 64 Rear Admirals. 19 Rear Admirals of the Red, 17 Rear Admirals of the White, and 24 Rear Admirals of the Blue. How do I put this politely? It's a complicated system, but the Royal Navy makes it work. Oh, and by that time also, the number of superannuated admirals at that point was 31. Now, theoretically, when this system is sort of set up, it's, it's supposed to be the Royal Navies are going to be in three squadrons, and each one has an admiral, or the admiral of the fleet, in charge with a vice admiral and a rear admiral. So that's theoretically a nine admiral system. By 1769, that has expanded to what is in effect a 29 admiral system. And by 1812, we are talking about a 191 admiral system. Now, that does reflect both the variety of squadrons going around the world, the size of the Royal Navy by 1812, the literally hundreds of ships you're dealing with, uh, the fleets you have going on, the ports you have to set up, because you remember, you, admirals are not just about the fleets in the sea, they're also about commanding your dockyards, your administrative facilities in the West Indies, and all over places, there are governors in certain, in certain areas. 
they are a significant part of your administration as well as your your operation. So that's where the admirals are coming. And also, there's the fact that a significant number of them tend to be wounded at any one point. But they won't keep fighting battles. Anyway, here we have Vice Admiral of the White. So if we quick back look there and go Vice Admiral of the White. Ooh, not the most senior Vice Admiral. In fact, let's be honest, that's pretty much lower. It's the top of the lower, lower half. So, not as some people tend to tell me with Nelson, he was super senior. He was the he was the most senior Royal Navy Admiral deployed. No, he wasn't. He's one of the most experienced. After all, let's consider, and this especially goes in comparison to um, the discussion of the French counterparts. Uh, the American War of Independence. He fought at the Battle of Fort Saint Jean, the and the Battle of Grand Turk. In the War of the First Coalition, he was part of the Siege of Calvi, the Battle of Genoa, the Battle of Hidris Island, Hidris Island uh, the Battle of Cape St. Vincent, the, the Sultan Cadiz, the Battle of Santa Cruz de Tenerife, and the Battle of Nanao. Uh, let's see, in the War of the Second Coalition, he takes part in the Siege of Malta, the Battle of Copenhagen, and the Raid on Boulogne. And in the War of the Third Coalition, it's the Battle of Carthago. Honestly, that's enough battles to make a whole suite of French animals happy at this point. They won't have anywhere near that level of experience. His flagship is HMS Victory, a 104-gun first-rate ship of the line. She's neither weak nor the biggest, but she is a very capable ship. As a first-rate... There are vessels bigger than her, and there are admirals who are in bigger first rates because they are more senior admirals in more dangerous positions. But he is sent with this flagship, he is sent with this fleet to blockade the French fleet in Toulon. And then if they manage to break out from Toulon, to follow them and find them and bring them to battle. That is his job. The Royal Navy is not doing a blockade system of we are blockading ports. They're doing a blockade system of we are blockading fleets. Think of it as, like, well, when you're doing defense in basketball, okay, when you're def the defending team, you will mark someone, and that will be your person. You will either go with a sector defense, where you each person in the team has a particular area they are in charge of looking after, or you will have a, that's my person. Wherever they move, I follow them. I ignore all the other players on the enemy team because they're your problems. I have to focus on that. Both those methodologies require actually some sort of thinking about it. I, if you the other, if you're one of your colleagues isn't quite in the right place and someone's going through that line, that area, you better cover their area. If you are focusing all on one player and they are terrible then perhaps you should back off them a bit. Still keep an eye on them, but also back up your colleagues who are trying to deal with the better players. But it's and it's the same with the Royal Navy and its fleet moving around. And so it has lots of fleets deployed. And Nelson is commanding the Mediterranean one. Why? Because look at all the experience he has in the Mediterranean. Who best to send to the deal with Toulon? And he tries a trick, and it almost works. And let's be honest, we're all very, la very glad that Napoleon didn't have Nelson on his side, because the fact he'd lived this long, considering all these battles and all this time wounded in action, suggests that Nelson was pretty darn lucky. Cuffbook Collingwood. Now, first things first, those are some of the guns which still survive at the Collingwood Monument on Tyneside. So if you're near Tyneside, go and have a look at them. They're cool. He is commanding from HMS Royal Sovereign. That's his flagship. A hundred gun first rate. His battle experience is slightly less than Nelson's. That's because Nelson has a habit of being assigned to mobile fleets. Collingwood has an assigned uh, has a habit of being assigned to blockading fleets. 
Both are incredibly taxing duties. But when he has been involved in battles, he's acquitted himself very, very well. He's trusted. But the thing is, you have one who one of your officers is pretty much the equivalent of a cocker spaniel, constantly high energy, able to zap around everywhere. And the other one is. Well, I would normally say a standard poodle, but that, that, that's probably not going to come across as well. There. And I have a standard poodle. Okay, the fluffy research assistant calls it is a standard poodle. And in my experience, they can be very high energy when they want to be. But when they don't, they tend to be lying down and going, I'm resting. And they're also, like Cocker Spaniels, usually fairly smart. And Cocker Spaniels. Okay, people are probably going to go, oh no, Cocker Spaniels aren't smart. They are smart. They tend to get exactly what they want. They do it by being goofy, but they get exactly what they want. And he is a good, competent admiral. He is a vice admiral of the blue. So let's go through this one. Below, a vice admiral of the white. So that means Elson's in charge of him if they get together. And this is the other advantage the Royal Navy has of the color system. Okay. It's not just about times in rank, and they don't just have to promote someone to Admiral. You can promote someone up the colors. So you can promote someone from Vice Admiral of the Blue to Vice Admiral of the Red. Which is actually what happens to Cuthbert Conrad after the Battle of Trafalgar. Skip the white, go straight to the red. Two levels of seniority. Whew, straight through. And does it matter about time service? Nope. So, they haven't had to promote him to Admiral. But they found a way of going, we trust you more than other Vice Admirals, so we're going to give you a bump up. The Vice Admiral in Red. And that means automatically any Vice Admiral, any Blue, any White Admiral, a Vice Admiral, or anyone below that, it turns up, you're in charge of them. It's actually quite a proficient system. And in some ways, if you were, I don't know, dealing with a far larger fleet again, You'd want to reinvent sections of that system. It's one of the interesting things. Whenever I've seen um, people organizing science fiction fleets, and they're talking about fleets of thousands, tens of thousands of ships, and you go, well, you either have to invent many, many layers of Admiral, or you're going to have to deal with being very strict about this role has this command duties, and hoping that no one in that some one role goes, I have more experience, I have more, I was promoted to Vice Amber before I hit the song was, therefore I should be in charge, not you. Or you'd actually have to reinvent the color system. You would have to use it again. Because it's a way of gradiating your senior officers. I'm almost surprised sometimes that the Chinese and the American navies don't have it. But I suppose they are saying it would claim they're just about small enough they can get away without it. The Royal Navy during World War II at one point seriously does toy with the idea of reinventing, bringing back the colour system. It never goes that far and doesn't thankfully reach Churchill or it would probably have actually been implemented and that would have confused everyone. But there is actually a consider option because it's a way of saying, right then, you're a rear admiral. Yes, well, every rear admiral comes in as a rear admiral of the blue. But you're a good one, so you're going to get promoted rapidly. You're a not so good one. You'll get promoted slowly. Might be, they might lay you out just as a rear admiral. And that's the, the beauty of the color system. <sighs> Robert Calder. Now, 
He, of course, gets into trouble because after the Battle of Cape Finisterre, instead of staying around with the whole of his fleet and supporting Nelson for the Battle of Trafalgar, where he certainly could have been useful, after all, if even if he wasn't useful, the fact he would have been a second Vice Admiral of the Blue to back up Collingwood would have been useful. The fact he just commanded a battle himself as senior officer would have been useful. And the fact that he had HMS Prince of Wales and 98 guns second rate ship of the line as his flagship would have been useful. But no, he decides to go home to try and clear his name instead of fighting a battle which would have cleared his name. Born in the Seven Years' War, American Revolutionary War, French Revolutionary Wars, Battle of Cape St. Vincent, and the Battle of the Third Coalition. And because he managed to live longer than the other two, he does get more senior, get to a more senior post. It's the advantage of not being uh, not being actually sent out, and the Royal Navy needing uh, to occasionally promote people to senior ranks so they can use them for posts. <sighs> He does the best in the role he's given he can, and he's a fairly decent admiral, and let's, let me explain why. So, here is his promotion track. He's made a rear of the blue in 1799. That's two years after Nelson. And two years after Collingwood, who, notice, starts off as a rear admiral of the white. Jump straight from blue to white. It doesn't get even stop a blue, go straight to white. And Nelson goes blue and then jumps to red. In February 1799. Collingwood jumps to red in 1801. Calder jumps to white in 1801. So two years. Of the blue, he makes white, and then roughly a year after making white, he makes red. So it takes him three years to roughly to jump between the three, uh, to jump from rear admiral blue to red. Whereas Nelson does it in two, so he's good, not amazing. Uh, Collingwood. He starts off on white. So in a way, he starts off higher, but then he jumps to that in red in after four years. But both of them make it to red before Calder does. Calder then becomes a Vice Admiral of the Blue. He does some impressive things in April 1804. Same time as Collingwood becomes Vice Admiral Blue in 1804. And Collingwood gets made red in November 1805. Calder becomes white in November 1805. Promotions after Trafalgar. Yes, you won a battle. But not that great one. So you're only going up to, eight, uh, up to white. Collingwood jumped straight ahead, and if Collingwood had lived longer, he would have got promoted far more senior and uh, more far more quickly. Is the next three years for Calder to reach red? In total, it takes him four years to go from blue to red. Collingwood does it in a little over a year, in a year and a half. Nelson, in comparison, goes from blue to white in a little over two years. Which, to be fair, means Calder actually goes faster up from blue to white than Nelson. So you can see, as officers are doing good things that attract positive attention, they can get promoted more quickly. Officers, when they're not doing good things that aren't attracting positive attention, can find their career slowed down. But you still have the option of promoting them later. 
it would be and if we go back to this the, the thing at the front if we considered it and um, consider it today with the modern nato rankings the ranks you've got in front of you do actually accord quite significantly with qf7 well of7 to of10 okay rear admiral being of7 and of course you can say that the fact that one of the reasons we don't need this is we've added in commodore as a lower rank but they still use commodore in this period as well so occasionally and you'll get one of the battles we're talking about in this campaign is commodore someone acting in the role of commodore i.e a senior captain but it's the build it's pretty much the equivalent of saying right then you have of7 of seven point three, of seven point six, or however you want to divide it up, and then of eight, of eight point three, of eight point six, of nine, nine point three, nine point six, and of ten. And the point is. It gives the Royal Navy the ability to gratiate not only between its rear, its admirals and its in terms of their roles, but to manage their careers more. They can just look at them and decide who are the seagoing admirals, who are not seagoing admirals, who's going to be having this, who's going to be doing this. And again, modern Royal, the current Royal Navy doesn't need this. They do not have enough ships. But it actually, for a larger fleet with more ships, this system actually makes a lot of sense. Right. On to Sir Richard Strachan, Baronet. At this point, he is a captain acting in the role of Commodore. And he's in charge of HMS Caesar, an 80 gun third rate ship of the line, and has other ships. And he is sent out and takes part and actually commands in the Battle of Otegel. So. He is the guy who beats up Dumois. And he's fought in the American Revolutionary War, Battle of Porto Praia, Battle of Sardras, then the French Revolutionary Wars, action off the 23rd of April, 1794, the War of the Third Coalition, the Battle of Cape Ortegal, and then he'll also take part in the War of the Fifth Coalition as an admiral. He goes on to more senior rank. Unsurprisingly. Doesn't always go as planned, doesn't always go as he wants, doesn't suddenly have the career he'd like because he upsets one of the king's favourites, who's an army general, mainly because they don't, the two of them turn out to be almost as bad as the Royal Navy command uh, the Royal Navy and Army command structure in Norway in nineteen forty. In terms of their ability to talk to each other because of the senior officers involved. But they're not that bad, and they're not quite as bad as them. Because at least they have the excuse that they don't have radio. And this is actually a painting, um, I think, of Ortegal, of the battle. Especially of his ship, which was HMS Caesar. And again, an 80 gun, third rate ship of the line, one of a couple like Northumberland, who will also feature in this. Uh, particular discussion. The Royal Navy has a habit of certain ships going around. And they do like to have, they do concentrate on churning out 74s and third rates of some, but they're also, they have some experimental ships out there, <coughs> which are used for certain stations. And they're useful for those stations. Here is Cochrane, Rear Admiral the Blue, at this point, Alexander Cochrane. So, again, let's notice at this point, and when we're talking about him, he is a rear admiral of the blue. He goes on to far more senior rank, but he at this point is a rear admiral of the blue. I. He's the most junior of the lot. His flagship. HMS Northumberland, a 74-gun third-rate ship of the line, which suited 
mm, his position and his power and status of the uh, leave on the island side, uh, station as his uh, role, which was his role. He fought during the American War of Independence. During uh, he doesn't get any fighting credit for the um, some of the wars in between because he always seems to be stationed where there isn't any action or spends his entire time chasing around hoping for action, but doesn't actually get any. And then the War of eighteen twelve. Takes part in the burning of Washington, the Battle of Baltimore, and the Battle of New Orleans. Not always the best admiral the Royal Navy has, but he's wandering around the Caribbean and he's doing his duty out there. And this is another point. With the lovely plans that Napoleon comes up with. What would have happened if the Royal Navy had learned to those plans and managed to let those fleets skip out, but it had a far larger fleet waiting off Martinique for when they arrived. A fleet that got there maybe a few days beforehand and was waiting just out of sight. So remember, they sailed in way, they would still be tired, to jet and tired and hungry and everything from the journey, and a fresh, rested Royal Navy fleet could just come in take them out. It's unlikely. And it would depend on the intelligence gathering system which were which provided the required information. But it's always a possibility and it's something which can't be discounted that easily by French. Especially as the Royal Navy already have ships out there. Under this map. And William Cornwallis who is Admiral of the Blue, and then Admiral of the White in 1805. So let's go back and check those rankings. Yeah, pretty much as senior as you can be. Only one who outranks him is St. Vincent. He is commanding his squadron, a uh, fleet, the Channel Fleet, from HMS Ville de Paris. 110 gun, first rate, built at Chatham Dockyard, given the name of vessel captured during the Battle of the Saints. Yep, HMS Ville de Paris was the flagship of the Channel Fleet, just as Napoleon was commanding the Army of England. And this is the officer who basically, for Napoleon's plan to work, had to be duped twice. At least. Fought in the Seven Years' War, at the Siege of Louisburg and the Battle of Quiberon Bay, under Hawk. At the, uh, during the American War of Independence, fought, uh, fought at the Battle of Grenada, the Battle of St. Kent, and the Battle of the Saints. During the Third anglo messor War, fought at the reduction of Pondicherry. And during the French Revolution Wars, the First Battle of Gras. No fights in the Napoleonic Wars. Nope. No fights during the Napoleonic Wars. Simple reason. No point does the French fleet come out. Every time the French fleet comes anywhere near him, they run away. He's quite disappointed, really. They're being very cruel. He's looking forward to adding to his laurels. And Cornwallis is one of those really interesting characters. And again, the reason I mentioned Pitt, when I was talking about earlier, and of course, Nelson, we can talk about his relationships. <clears throat> And Horatia. And all, and all the other things he gets involved in. <sighs> Thank you, Emma Halton. Thank you, his wife. All these things. Nelson, of course, has all those scandals. But how do I put this? Who's to say what normal was? Cornwallis never marries. He eventually purchases an estate in Milford-on-Sea in Hampshire, the Newlands estate. And he finds himself lonely there, so he calls his friend Captain John Whitby, along with his wife, Mary Anna Teresa Whitby, to come live with him. Whitby dies in 1806.
The family stays at the house. Mary and Teresa looking after Cornwallis into his old age. And when he dies in 1819, he passes everything and his fortune on to Mary Whitby and her daughter. Now, you can sit there and go, well, what was his relationship with her? Were they good friends? Um, what went on? And you can speculate all you like, but it's a massive house. And having some company might have been nice. And I think my opinion has always been that him and John had been good friends in the service. They had travelled the world and depend on each other in fighting many, many times. He does better in his career than John does. John finishes a captain. Cornwallis, a very senior admiral. Has no family. Thus, I hasn't married. I think he wanted company. And I think he invited his friend and said, look, you can't find a place to live. Come live with me until you find a place. Bring your family. I've got plenty of space. You can imagine the conversation. Because you've probably heard it a dozen times in real life between friends. Oh, you're between you're between uh, flats or this. Oh, come stay with me. I've got space. I've got a spare room. I've got, I've got a freaking mansion. Come stay with me. And after a while, well, they can't find anywhere nicer. And frankly, he doesn't mind the company. And also, he's off commanding a fleet all the time. Going away. So it's someone running his estate and looking after his affairs for him while he's away. And then when Whitby dies, would you chuck the wife of your deceased friend out on the street or make her go find a place to live? I mean, she's... Someone might prey on her. So my prayer is the daughter, who is basically you've been raising almost as your niece, because that's what you're sort of in the sort of relationship. No, not a. It's what not what you do. So they're his family. They might not be by blood, but they're family by relatives. The point I'm trying to make is that a lot of naval officers at this time, and a lot of on the politician at this time, all these things are very busy fighting wars. That's a bad point that's often forgotten. They are so busy fighting wars, they are so busy serving their country, going around the world or dealing with the pressures of running the state or going, outside. they don't develop the social skills you would expect in order to socialise in polite society and find someone to marry. Nelson, in, may, in a way, is abnormal because he does manage to find someone to marry, and then he manages to almost find someone to fall in love with him a second time as well, in Emma Hamilton. That's unusual for naval officers. Finding not one, but two people who are prepared to put up with you and your vagrant lifestyle. You're disappearing for months on end. The, the, thing, the, the fact that they might be left alone and you might end up dying. A naval officer in the service is not the thing mothers are selling their daughters they want to marry at this time. Yes, they could come home rich but they also might not come home at all, or they might come home penniless and crippled. And then there's the fact that at sea, they spend all their time in the company of other men who just, get, they just don't develop the skills. They're not the Spartans, but they don't, you know, don't develop necessarily the same skills. Which is another reason why it might seem strange to us, but actually some admirals were very happy to turn a blind eye to officers' wives and captains' wives and children living on their ships, especially during peacetime and, or when they're on stations far away from home, coming with them. You get the remarks of a, being a civilizing atmosphere or a civilizing of thing, but actually what they're meaning is not civilizing, socializing. 
as in there is socialization. As in their officers, their young officers who are coming to maturity at sea, away from families, away from the civilian world, actually have a window into it and some understanding. And that's useful for when you have to do naval diplomacy, when you have to go ashore and meet and take part in these soirees and these events and do the politics. Which is, to this day, a big problem for navies. Because they, they have to do balance those two roles. They have to both serve at sea, go around the world, meet interesting, exciting people in other places, and also deal the politics at home. And it's a completely different scenario. The way you socialize on a ship when you can't get away from people, no matter how far you go, you can't get more, you can't get that far away from people, and you're going to have to work for them, is very different than how you might act when you're dealing with problems at home. If you're on a ship, you might well sort things out straight away. Just go, mm, let's deal this, because if it festers, it's going to cause us trouble. And go on and call from the command, so let's de deal with it. Whereas at home, you might just ignore it and hope it goes away. Because that's a more polite thing to do in society, in polite society perhaps. What have we got coming up? I'm looking forward to the good, the bad, and the Singapore. Logistics is going to be interesting. It's going to be all around the operational bases, the command structures, and where the bases are, where the major ports are, and what they're thinking of in terms of their distance and operation. And the fleet auxiliaries they were actually constructing. And probably some of the problems in Singapore. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed, and I hope you'll look forward to part four, which is the early campaign.